Hey, happy Easter, everybody. Um, how are you doing? So it's just over a year since I did my first video when we launched the first survey on the 29th of March, 2020. Uh, this was after the closures of the English language schools on the 13th of March of that uh, year. Um, and since the closures uh, and up until the 29th, I've been working and talking with other students and teachers and people who've been through the STAMP 2 process who knew how confusing it was uh, for people who were stuck in limbo about how to best help people in a lockdown situation when people can't come and meet each other. And it was on the 29th of March, 2020, that we launched the first survey and the first video. So if you look back on this YouTube channel, it's all there for everyone to see. Um, we launched that first survey. And of course, in Ireland, there's um, rules about data collection. So you have to identify yourself and you have to identify the purposes of why you're collecting that data. So at that point, um, we were working just as individuals. Um, some people were working you know, behind the scenes on, um, on data, on designing the survey and had other jobs and other obligations. Uh, so basically, um, once I got my PUP and figured out that I was gonna be okay, I was able to dedicate full time. So I had to identify myself by name and that's why I did it in the first survey. Um, the demand, I mean, the need was soon apparent. Uh, we had over a thousand people respond to the first survey within a week or so. Um, and then the people I was working with who included uh, a Brazilian who'd been through the stamp two process, a Syrian, uh, an Indian and a French guy, just to name a few. These are people who were helping me figure this out so we could um, make sure that the problems that people were experiencing would, would be, um, would be, could be illustrated properly. It soon became apparent that this was much more than a set of individuals could handle. And it was suggested to me that an organization for the people we were focusing on, the students, um, which was requested as well from people who said that they needed resources, they needed an organization which they could be part of, needed to be set up. So um, that was in April. So we started on the 29th of March. And then in April, we, uh, working with uh, data people and tech people, bought a website. And first it was called lc.ie and then it became lsu.ie. And the idea was that a space for English language students in Ireland where they could go and find out from each other what were the issues they were facing and help each other solve their problems. So that was um, the, the reason why we went about things the same way. I so say you have to identify yourself. So I identified myself by name. We wanted to find the extent of the problem, identify what the problems were, and explicitly I said we would be working with political leaders and union organizers, and that we ourselves would organize. So that's in the very first video, and we explain that and we explain why. So it's very important to be fully upfront from before and, and as you go through. So if you looking back, and it's just over a year now since the, um, since this started, um, the contact details were given as transparently as possible. Um, we gave an update then on the first survey on the 2nd of April of 2020, um, 2020 yeah, um, uh, got feedback and questions, we were able to look at some of the trends, security being, you know, different types of security, people not feeling safe at home if they were in room shares, at work, in schools, how their schools were communicating with them, what the issues they were dealing with, um, and how they could be supported. Um, and I suppose you know, we, we pointed out we, we were working already with, with people in different political parties and backgrounds, um, you know, because, as I said, Ireland isn't a country of political extremes. So basically, in, a pan in the context of a pandemic, we knew that people were uh, from different backgrounds uh, in Ireland would want to support. And of course, this is a community um, it, it, that we are dealing with, uh, especially in a pandemic. Um, you can't let any subset of the population be more vulnerable than anyone else. Um, and that's the idea why we wanted to act as an intermediary and support students to find the solutions themselves to their own problems and to facilitate that process. Um, it had, of course, been born out of previous experiences we've had um, in unions, both in Ireland and abroad, and especially using technology um, in lieu of being able to meet in place, in a place. Um, some of us had used iPads and technology uh, with uh, home 
uh, home care workers, so people who care for people who are at home um, and are unable to come and protest. And that was um, my own experience in California, the same area where it says the Chavez and people set up the United Fruit Workers in Coachella and Indio. This whole area was a place where um, we'd learned um, the, how technology can be used and particularly in a pandemic, very useful, you know, for, for using questionnaires to figure out what people are feeling, what they need done, what they're experiencing and how they can have their voices heard in more meaningful ways. Um, we let people know about the HSE recruitment drive. Some of our students uh, went and became jobs as, as different things, cleaners and, 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 uh, and, and other jobs like that. Uh, we have, um, and then, um, you know, the whole idea was based on, from the beginning, we said it was based on, you know, Paulo Freire, um, critical theory, as that relationship between educators and students as being one where we learn together, we share knowledge, we pool knowledge, and it's not a top-down um, approach. It's not. Um, it's it's one which is which is based in in informing each other and and helping each other find ex, you know what are the identifying the problems and then finding the solutions and pooling your agency really so that you can have a, a stronger voice. Um, then we 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 started working and looking get support. First, we got support from. Richard Boyd Barrett of the People for Profit Party, which was great. Then Claire Daly from the Independence for Change, she supported us, as did her colleague Dean Mulligan. And then Sinn Féin and other people party started coming forward saying, look, if there's any way we can help, we don't want anyone to be stuck during this uh, crisis, during the pandemic. Um, so that moves on. If that was, it wasn't until I think the 16th of April, we managed to get the results of the survey into the Irish Times. Now, when you're building a campaign, when you're building a, a, an organization in Ireland, of course, things don't happen overnight um, and it had to be built. So we knew that, you know, awareness of the problem was very important, not just awareness that we would be aware, like you were already very aware of what the situations you were going through, but we had to get people in their living rooms aware of what the situation was. And um, it wasn't until I think 16th of April that the Irish Times published an article um, about the extent of the problem. Um, so uh, we went as well to um, meet with different people in the English language education sector. So the Department of Education invited us to give the results of our survey. We met with school owners, we met with other people and were asked to present the, the findings. At that stage, you know, not being able to get PPS numbers, not being able to get IRP, Irish residency permit cards processed, and problems with landlords, problems with um, employers, we're all being identified. And um, so we, and I said the people before at the very beginning who I was working with were mostly in data and tech. So they were very supportive and able to build the resources, but because they have day jobs and stuff like that, they weren't necessarily um, able to, to help and in other ways which were needed. So I called on a friend of mine who's a counselor out in Clondalkin and I said, hey, so this is the situation we need. Uh, uh, could you put me in touch with some people? Because I've been away from Dublin for a couple of years, you know, um, uh, and I said, who would you know who'd be able, you know, speak Spanish, Portuguese, and, and, and some of the other languages uh, who could help us um, interface? So I was introduced to somebody um, from one organization and uh, I'd known them before. I'd known that organization years ago. And uh, I said, fair enough, that's grand. And in good faith, I, um, I offered up and I said, look, this is the data we're working with. And again, you, know, you have to be GDR compliant, so GDPR compliant. So it's, you have to trust that the people you're working with are on, understand basically that this isn't uh, a game. It's very serious and you have to sort of go about things in the correct way. And um, at the very first meeting that, or the very first chat I had with, with the people who were brought on at that point, um, uh, it was we we made it clear that uh, pro, a project had already been started by myself and others uh, to build a union, to build an organisation. People who've been through Stamp Two, because this is going to be a, a problem not just for the foreseeable future in the pandemic, but beyond this. You know that the resources that English language students needed uh, will should need to be put in place long term. Um, 
And, and that, that's what we were already building. And I've already had feedback from students as well as people who've been through that experience. Um, when these people got um, involved from the different solidarity campaigns, and we said, this was the situation, you know, we're building an organization and we need to be able to, um, you know, help with outreach and translation and communication. And, and, um, and they said that at that stage, they were more comfortable with uh, a campaign rather than an organization. I said, fair enough. You know, I said, well, look, we are building a, an organization. You're welcome to join. If you don't want to do that right now, that's fine. We'll focus on a campaign. Makes sense to me. Perfect. Great. Um, the door was left open, of course. Um, and those people, of course, they already had their own organization. So I understand and you have to respect that. Um, so when it came to the stage when we um, started having more meetings with the students, like we were interacting on a one-on-one -on -one basis. My uh, personal Facebook and WhatsApp was ping, ping, pinging all the time. Um, and of course, I wanted to move it away from being uh, directed at one person or not. And that's always been the objective, okay? But you have to start somewhere and you have to be accountable in the process, okay? Um, and what we did is we had some meetings um, and we did it through English, Spanish and Portuguese being the main languages, but not the only languages uh, of the students who are affected. Turkish being another very important language in Ireland. There's a lot of Turkish students and not just as many languages as people here from all over the world. And I mean, the vast majority are from Latin America, uh, where of course I have a lot of experience myself along with others. So we were, a lot of us were coming from the Latin American background and those of us who'd worked and lived in Latin America but of course, um, the idea was to make it fully open and acceptable for everyone, regardless of their level of English. So we wanted the people to feel included. Um, and of course it was, um, in, uh, and it was on the middle of May, I believe on the 13th or the 14th of May, um, we had a meeting. Now there was going to be an announcement by the Minister of Justice. Um, and we knew that the English Language Education Working Group they were going to redefine the terms of references, the terms of reference of that group. What does that mean? That means that the group that meets to discuss the problems in the English language sector, it has membership, okay? And up until that point, the membership had only been really been the government departments, education, justice, foreign affairs, social protection, and representatives of Enterprise Ireland and the English language uh, schools themselves. So MEI, and uh, PCN and different owners of the schools. Um, not even the teachers, not even the unions. So um, I think that's very important to point out. The English language teachers didn't have a say at that point, uh, but we did. Um, uh, first of all, as guests um, and uh, the other people who were there, supposedly to, you know, who, who are there sort of long-term are ICOS uh, and they work with international students as a whole. Um, their membership is mostly derived from universities and the universities themselves pay money to um, ICOS to represent the interests and find out what's going on with the international students. Um, we had been in touch with ICOS because after our survey was published, um, they had sort of touted these results and didn't necessarily give credit to those of us who had been working on us. So we said, look, it's fine, we want to work together, but like maybe we should have had a meeting, et cetera, and let's stay in touch. And to be honest, that was over a year ago. And um, even though we're working on the same issues, um, I guess I've never offered to have a meeting um, directly with the students and ELSU, uh, who, and I'll get to that foundation of ELSU now. So basically we realized that ahead of this terms of reference, uh, the new terms of reference, we were gonna have to make sure that students had a voice long-term. And there was a time limit on that. So we had been building it, and we were working with people who said they want to be part of a campaign rather than an, uh, an organization or a union. But those of us who were working on the, the union, students as well as other people who've been through the stamp too, uh, made it very clear with the people we're working with that now, okay, this is the time we need to form the union and to get it going. And we had a meeting with, um, with over 50 people at the first meeting. They were, um, I would say, um, uh, from all over, from all over the world, representative of the students, and we basically said, "Look, we're going to form this union formally now," um, and we discussed about what that would mean. And we said, "Look, we're not ready to have a constitution. We're not ready to 
necessarily go into the finer details of what this union will look like long term. But before the terms of reference are set, we need to make sure that we're sitting at the table. So we based the founding statement on the existing terms of reference of the working group, of the original working group. Um, and this was used, you know, and very transparently, it was a strategic decision to make sure that they couldn't deny ent uh, our, our entry, they couldn't deny that students were full stakeholders and teachers as well, to be able to um, give the real life story of what's happening in the classroom, what's happening at home, what's happening with the people who are um, paying the money and doing the work. So that was made very clear. And the people I was working with uh, at the time, you know, were fine and they celebrated. They were saying, well done. When the founding statements came out of the meeting, they were like, that's great, well done, et cetera, et cetera. Now, there was one chap who said afterwards that he had some questions. I said, no problem, let's talk about it. So we talked about it and he basically said he wasn't in agreement with um, the founding statement uh, because it, oh, um, it wasn't sort of left-wing enough that the, the rhetoric wasn't sort of more overtly left-wing and I said okay because their own background some of the solidarity campaigns were more like overtly like left-wing and that's fine. Now the student union has to be there for all students and it has to be sort of be there and uh, for people of whatever background so it's not necessarily like a political party or another type of group which identifies you know in one ideology or the other. It's more about making sure every student has a voice and that we have a safe space to have those conversations and communication being key at all stages. So the point was said that, you know, that the, the language of the founding statement wasn't radical enough. And I said, I understand that from their perspective. Thanks for the feedback. But this is already something that already had been voted on uh, unanimously and agreed by uh, two at the people, uh, agreed um, to by the people at the meeting. So um, that was fine. And afterwards, there was a, a request that the founding of ELSU should somehow be called into question because this chap who, um, and I must, and I don't want to really get into personal politics and personal items, uh, personal things, because um, to be honest, this has been going on in the background since last May or June, and uh, these things, and I intentionally didn't want to bring them up because they're not really relevant to most people. Um, but this you know, particular chap in his own statement from the organization that he pretends to represent says that you know, um, Evo Morales is not left enough for him. And that's fine. And that's a debate that can be had in that country for those people to have like that. Um, you know, I, I've lived in Latin America myself for a long time. And I know that as Europeans, you shouldn't get involved in local issues and pretend to know. And I remember back in April of 20. 2009, um, I was a candidate in the European elections and there was an Irish man who was tragically killed in Bolivia. And I was asked by a journalist for my response to that. And I didn't want to give one because it was a tragic case. But basically those of us who go to Latin America understand that, you know, being seen as a European involving yourself in local issues isn't something which normally can always have the intended results. So even with the best of intentions, you can maybe sometimes uh, end up in situations which aren't favorable for anybody. And that's particularly a reality. In Mexico, they have Article 33 of the Constitution, which forbids non-Mexicans from involving themselves in local politics and national politics. And those of us who have gone over to Latin America understand and respect that. However, it seems that you know the same logic uh, has come from um, from that in from that situation was being projected back into this situation in Ireland, which was basically saying that um, that uh, people shouldn't uh, so basically lumping Irish English language speakers in with other English language speakers such as Americans and British people etc shouldn't involve themselves with uh, with uh, Latin Americans. And um, now I understand in the Latin American context, that's a valid argument. But in the context of an Irish situation where it affects everybody, we're talking as a community, and those of us who have been around longer and know how things work and are here merely to facilitate, uh, it isn't really something that rings true. And it's not something, so the students we've been working with um, never expressed that they wanted, uh, you know, not Irish people to not be involved in, in, what, in organizing 
around these these issues. Um, and the outcome from that debate wasn't really resolved with this gentleman. And, and actually, you know, he, he, he said that um, we had a meeting, he, we came and we talked. He said that he would rather work against anything that somebody like me as a white English speaking European is how he classified me, was involved in uh, rather than sort of uh, just work along parallel. I said, you have your organization, we could complement each other massively, even if you're not formally part of ELSU, that's fine. And he, he rejected that. So, I mean, that's fine. You have to respect where people are, uh, but you also have to ask that people respect where you and other people are. And that didn't really seem to be uh, forthcoming. Um, and after that, I was walking in the Phoenix Park um, just under a year ago, and I, I happened across, it was a Saturday or Sunday morning, and I saw the Taoiseach Lee over Radcar, as of course, the, as in Ireland, of course, these things do happen. Suddenly you're walking Phoenix Park and it's just you and the Taoiseach jogging towards you. So I had a brief conversation with Leo Varadkar back then. And I basically said, look, we're working with these issues, with these questions, these matters, and uh, who would be a good person in your office to uh, help us have a look at it? And we got the contact detail of the person. And when I came back from that meeting and I reported it to the individual, I said, he accused me of being friends with uh, Leo Varadkar, or Leo is my friend. Now, you know, Ireland's a small place, and from a long time ago, you don't get anywhere by being insulting. Like, and I suppose that works, that's true in communities, but also in politics. And it goes way back, um, you play the ball, not the man, or not the woman, as the old saying goes. Um, and it kind of comes back to, uh, even to the time of, Charles Parnell, when uh, Ireland was divided, because there was the first chance of getting an Irish parliament uh, under Parnell was scuppered because some people said, no, we shouldn't work with Parnell because um, Catholics shouldn't engage with the Protestants. He was Protestant and, and personal reasons were given for not working and trying to undermine the work that Charles Parnell had been doing. And this is something which destroyed him as a person, destroyed him as a man, he died early and also scupper the, the chances of um, an Irish parliament for, for at least another generation. Uh, and up until, you know, this day or in Easter 1916, when we finally gave birth to the Republic in, in, in another way. But I mean, there are reasons why it's not just about being polite, but it's about being sort of conscious that rhetoric is one thing, but reality is another. So when I met with Leo Varadkar the first time, uh, this chap who I was chatting to, um, he said that he, he wouldn't have, I said, well, yeah, I did speak with him because I had the opportunity to, why wouldn't I? He goes, well, I wouldn't speak with Leo. I, I would shout at him and I would chase him. And I was like, okay, that sounds great, but it's not really a practical thing to do because if you have the opportunity to raise an issue, um, even if you disagree with the man politically, you, uh, don't do that. You don't, that sounds grand, but like, it's not really, um, it's not really mature, I would say. It be, would be another thing, but you have to respect each to their own. And, and that was fine. So around that point, um, we had been having weekly meetings and uh, he stopped coming. And basically he was um, friends with other people. And this happens also in, in Dublin sometimes in capital cities. Uh, sometimes people confuse their activism with their social circle. So basically uh, you have a social milieu of people you hang about with, you identify in the same way. And basically, you know, but I would agree with the idea that when everyone thinks the same, nobody is thinking. So it's actually good to have a different, have different perspectives and debate. And uh, in any case, that led to a situation where Elsa had been founded legitimately with 50, 50, 50 people attending the meeting and agreeing on the founding statement. Uh, we were to move on with the formation of a constitution and a committee, etc. But because of this misunderstanding with this gentleman, uh, that was put on hold and other people then, who were friends with him, who I had been working with, said okay, and the, uh, that they were, weren't comfortable unless this gentleman was was also comfortable. So we did our best. We tried to talk through the issues, didn't get anywhere, but we did go back to what had been agreed. Uh, 
the people who got involved in a campaign said they wanted to be part of a campaign, not an organization. The door was never closed to them. They were, they were invited, but they didn't pr proceed. We continued meeting with the students, those of us who did want to create the union, who did create the union. We continued having these meetings, in, uh, representing and discussing the problems and, the, of, and communicating back and forth between government. It was a big workload and we were looking as well for, for more people to get involved as we always have, we, the doors are open. But because of that problem, and I suppose at this stage, those of us who were active together last June, this is when people lost focus a little bit. And I mean, in any campaign, no matter what difficulty you have, you always have to try and keep the main thing, the main thing. The main thing is a pandemic where a lot of people are affected and needing to have their problems heard and listened to and problems solved. So the idea was you set up the organization, you give it, you support it as much as you can, and you let it go into the future. Um, that was delayed. Um, I did want to have another meeting to try and see that those people want to come on involved, but they didn't respond to emails and messages and got kind of personal, and um, referring to my tone of skin or whatever, as some reason, or in English, you know, because I speak English. Now, I love the Spanish language. I was in Mexico when the United States invaded Iraq. And I personally boycotted the English language for months after that. I would refuse to speak English. So I understand that in Latin America, English is seen as the language of the oppressor. But for people who said that, you know, organizing with students should not be done through the English language, that's not really realistic in a situation where it's the target language of the students who come to, to, to Ireland to study. And most people, not everyone has the same strong feeling about English being, uh, you know, the language of the oppressor. And of course, we have people from Turkey and other countries who were feeling left out because a lot of stuff was being spoken about in just Portuguese and Spanish. So in any case, we've always had um, uh, people uh, try to translate and make sure we can move on. We've done that. We've built uh, uh, on the success. We've had meetings with TDs, with senators, with the Tonishta, the former Taoiseach, We've had meetings with the UN. We've had meetings with ambassadors. We've, um, we've done an awful lot with zero resources and um, no budget. So basically everything has been voluntary. Now I must mention that some of the other people who do get involved do work in organizations that do have funding, that do have resources. And in Ireland, um, you do have this, uh, a thing where if you're public funding, if you're publicly funded, there's certain standards you have to follow. And I simply made the point that it's fine if you don't want to be involved, but don't use the resources of your organization to undermine the work of other people who do want to create an organization, because that's not fair. So there was an absence of communication for since last June, basically, and it was started, you know, basically because of a disagreement with this one gentleman, and then uh, someone from the Brazilian left front too, uh, who, who, who supported. And, and that's fine, you know, an opinion is an important thing. But an opinion should not be confused with anything other than an opinion. And in our meetings, we have a lot of opinions and we synthesize from those what is the situation. We vote on them. We pass motions. Now, you can have an opinion on the motion, but you don't get to choose if the motion is valid or not if it's been passed by the majority, because that's the nature of democracy and the nature of how you organize. And that's basically what they were trying to do. So it's been a pity, but despite you know, recent and uh, prolonged attempts to sort of re-engage, I had to even go to their AGM, the AGM of the main organization that these people were from, just to be able to have a conversation with them. So we did that around the turn, just um, it was either December or January. And um, I said, look, let's clear the air. Let's, let's work together if you want to, but like, I don't want to get in your way. You shouldn't get in Elsie's way and let's continue working. And again, the same gentleman, <laughs> insulted personally and referred to my tone of skin and uh, called me a white savior and stuff because we're working in uh, in trying to improve the the lot of, of students here now we are in Ireland and of course there's different situations in different countries but othering people here who do want to help and who are do have experience so for example sometimes people go but why do you care um like basically I would wonder why would why would anyone not care why would you not in the context of a pandemic why would you not care especially when you have experience and knowledge and background and connections 
why would you not try and do the most? But the other reason is, I know what it's like to be treated badly by an, by an, an educational establishment. Over 10 years ago, I lost 30,000 euros of my time and my money, and I was treated very badly by a university in the center of Dublin, very badly. And it set my life back about three years, made me depressed, made me angry, etc. 30,000 euros and three years of my life that I could never get back again. You know, and, and that was a difficult pill to swallow, very difficult. And I lost a lot of momentum. So for that reason, that I would say that's the main reason why I could never get justice for myself when that happened to me. But I thought if we can get justice for these other people, then fair enough, let's do our best. Um, and um, also, I do know what it's like to be racially abused in another country. I have been beaten up for being Irish in England, okay, just like two years ago. So in an Irish context, saying that people, and um, let's just remember that we have had a connection between Ireland and Latin America for a long time. Um, uh, Francisco de Miranda um, was the guy from Caracas who helped interpret the values of the French Revolution to a young Simon Bolivar and to Bernardo O'Higgins. Um, and because the ideals of the French Revolution um, were more like for a European context. So being able to translate and them into what they would mean in the Latin American context was something that was done by an educator, a teacher like Francisco de Miranda, who taught in Richmond, close to London, uh, back in the day. And, and, and Bolivar and, um, and, and Bernardo Higgins were his students. Um, so basically there is a role and you have to understand the different contexts you're working in. Now to say that Irish people are basically the same as, as any other English speaker, uh, Americans or English people basically says more about the trauma that somebody might have with the English language. And that's valid. That's and people's trauma is valid. I mean, we all have trauma. The Irish have trauma around language around the Irish language. Um, those of us who've been, you know, the sons and daughters of people through war, been through other things have trauma. And it's important to be trauma informed when we discuss and sometimes not to take things too personally. But sometimes you do have individuals who take themselves more seriously than the projects and the campaigns they're involved in. And I'm afraid I feel that this is the case in this situation. Now, we did have the sales working group together um, and the admins were working well, relationships soured and an awful lot of potential um, was wasted. And I mean, I'm talking last summer, we could have been achieving an awful lot more, but people stopped attending meetings, people stopped communicating. Now the rules for the administrators are you must be courteous and you must stay in communication with each other. Okay, and if there's a problem of conflict, you sort it out because it's not about individuals, it's not about me, you or one person. It's about the idea that you have a lot of people who have given their data in, 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 in surveys and you have, you have already set about trying to do best for them with them. So um, bringing us up to uh, the last few weeks, we finally did get the constitution uh, agreed and voted on with the participation of students from all over the world here in Ireland and ideas from, from educators as well as students and people who, who had experience setting them up. This was done transparently. So the ELSU constitution was founded and the ELSU committee was voted in. So um, this democratic legitimacy, which was what um, the main question, the main objection that the person had back last June was dealt with. So now there's full, full transparency, full accountability, and full democratic sort of um, uh, credibility to the organization that was begun just over a year ago. And that's something to be celebrated, okay? And um, there was, and, but on, instead of celebrating this, I mean, there's the expression sour grapes. I mean, people can have opinions, but if, you know, your opinions are not sovereign, you have to allow other people to have their opinions too. And instead of celebrating the achievements of what these stu of students had achieved together with other people, um, there was a newspaper article that I was talking to the journalist for two weeks about it. And I realized that their other source was the person in question because for about two weeks, I was being asked questions, which I had to go back and prove that were, you know, that's basically that opinion that you've asked me about is not true because of this, this, this reason. 
And basically I had to spend two weeks of my life last year, instead of working on the projects we had, going back and proving what the actual sequence of events are. It's fully documented, you see. And, um, and, 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 and that was done. So that article came out last week and it's not really focused on the main thing. The main thing is the work we are doing in meetings we've had with people we're working with, cleaners, workers, delivery workers, students, and looking at all of the issues which affect students. But that's fine, the article came out and because it was, I had, there was basically based on the rebuttals or uh, proving that the other opinions had, hadn't really been accurate. It wasn't the article that this gentleman I referred to who, who'd been against El Su was, was hoping for. So he basically and others uh, were trying to do what we call in English a hatchet job, which is to try and undermine the work of El Su and myself. And it was a personal thing. They basically said before, he would like to do anything to see either Elsu or myself fail in this. And the thing is, it hasn't, it succeeded. And I'm just gonna step back as soon as possible. I cannot wait. I've got other things to do with my life and I want, but the thing is when you start something, you don't just leave it half done. So there's the new committee, there's the new constitution and everything. But it, I became aware that the person was, you know, misrepresenting the facts and, and trying to continue to show uh, uh, an, uh, an unrealistic and, and an untrue version of events. So, I mean, to be honest, this has been something that's gone on since last June. I didn't necessarily want to focus on it because it should, it's not relevant to what's going on for people who have much more serious questions going on. This drama isn't relevant, really. It's about results. So, um, so that was that. And I mean, I feel I have to make this video to answer that. Um, and I mean, there are other questions which I can follow up in writing, but, but um, it just seems like an awful waste of time and effort because um, it's all there, the timeline's there, the, the reasons people gave for either being involved or not involved were, are there. There's democratic accountability, they're there. There's rules for the admins of the Facebook groups, they're there. Everything is there to be seen. And the thing is, if you don't, if you neglect communication, if you don't correspond, if you don't repeat, and if you don't meet, if you don't agree to meet, as I've repeatedly offered, then you forfeit, you forfeit um, your, your involvement. Because in the end, the Facebook page, which we had built together, was being used to advertise things by other organizations who have their own Facebook pages, who have their own budget, such as ICOS and LASK. They have their own media platforms and um, this group was founded to primarily focus on the needs of English language students in Ireland during the pandemic and that's the nature and that's the focus so although we're glad to work with other people we won't be pushed and bullied out of the main focus so for a long time ago for, since a long time other people have stopped being active and uh, it was recently when this person wasn't just not responding to texts or emails but was actually removing posts that were based around, you know, the democratic institutions of Elsu and how to build the constitution and the committee was removing those posts. So that wasn't courteous and it didn't go about things in the right way. So seeing as there now is democratic accountability of this Facebook page and of the group, we have a new democratically uh, accountable admins who communicate with each other and who are not working at cross purposes. And that's the way it's gonna remain. Um, so we're very glad. In other news, we have support. We have um, an update. Uh, of course, the extension of the visas was announced on the till the 20th of, of, of September. I've been doing a lot of research with students and other people, uh, and basically it makes no sense. So, I mean, we have a list of questions which are going to be giving into the English language working group um, the, uh, for that have come from the students. But we've spoken to other groups and other people too who agree that the Wednesday in which the extension was announced until the 20th of September, if you count back the number of weeks that the extension is due until, it, it would have meant that students would have had to uh, buy a course two days before the extension was announced to avail of the course. And then, and then if you didn't do that, this extension wasn't valid for anybody. So it seems that the Department of Justice, uh, I mean, I think the Minister for Justice was trying to do the right thing and it seems that there was pushback from her department uh, because normally it's a 33 week course, you pay for that and you have a certain number of weeks to study and a certain number of weeks to uh, work. 
this, this uh, proposed extension doesn't allow for any time to work uh, and it must all be in study time until now on the 20th of September. This isn't what we've asked for. We asked for uh, in, the light, in light of the contribution made by our English language students that people should be allowed to work full time, 40 hours, enjoy the same protections as any other worker in this country, to be employed or self-employed equally as they see fit so that they, the jobs available to them are available to them legally and not through subcontracting or secondary contracts because that makes people more vulnerable. And because of, the, uh, because of these problems, there are more people falling into vulnerable situations. So we've been working to make sure this doesn't happen. Uh, we have had a lot of success in recent times and the most notable was our meeting with Leah Varadkar, particularly around STEM 2s and people working in the delivery sector. Now we've been working with riders um, since the beginning of the pandemic when they, they arose in the surveys, but particularly since September, more and more engaging about looking at these issues because when initially the Department of Justice um, made people give up their good, well-paying 40-hour jobs when online classes became available, a lot of people were pushed into work such as delivery work because they couldn't survive and they couldn't find jobs that were just 20 hours. So the Department of Justice has inadvertently contributed to a situation where people are being exploited and that the legal, the rules don't reflect the reality. So what we said in the department, the, the meeting with Leo Varadkar, is that if in, in, a, in a pandemic, if people are doing the work, they have to be respected as being the workers, of in, uh, uh, whether any frontline workers, they need to be treated with the dignity and respect. And if the rules don't reflect the reality, then the rules should change, not the people. The people shouldn't have to change. So we said, you know, people should be allowed to work 40 hours legally, understanding that a lot of people have spent their entire life savings to get here and to survive the pandemic. And a lot of people haven't been able to either make money or learn English properly. So in a sentence, I told Leo, we told Leo that the Irish state has broken its contract with the English language students. Okay, you didn't get what you paid for. You're not being treated properly. And it's up to the government and the, the state to do right by you. And that is what we've been working on. And that's what we're doing. There was some disinformation and misinformation given by people who uh, wanted to confuse issues. They tried to say that um, we were trying to push uh, an agenda which wasn't supported by the people who'd been involved in the process that led to the consultation. We'd worked for weeks uh, in interacting in WhatsApp, Facebook, Telegram groups, and different things, trying to get feedback. And the idea is that you, you build a consensus slowly, you improve on a consensus, but you don't get to cancel out the work of other people. Uh, we're here to support, we never said ELSU represents English language. Uh, we never said that ELSU represents uh, writers, or, um, but some of our members are writers and we do support them. Uh, and we support writers um, organizing for themselves. And we helped get SIP2 involved so that that can be done because in Ireland that's the only way things do get done is the government doesn't speak to individual workers it speaks through the through the unions and we've been glad of the support but once that's done we step back we step back and we, we allow people to continue so I mean that's the situation now there was some bullying that went on one of some of the writers I don't know if I want to mention them by name but the most famous writer basically in Dublin was subject to online bullying to threats of physical violence uh, etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, um, by, by people who either were misinformed or who had deliberately spread misinformation and that's illegal in Ireland you don't get to say whatever you want on the internet it has to be backed up by fact you can't you don't get to threaten people on the internet and uh, you have to be, you're, you're accountable for your actions and your words on the internet there's the defamation law of 2009 but there's also cocos law which is new it says internet bullying etc is illegal so you can't do that you can't threaten people and you can't bully people so um there were people who were subjected to that and uh, you have to remember that whenever uh, an economy changes whenever sort of uh things get better so for example when the taxis were regulated in ireland i don't know how many years ago there were some people who were making a lot of money out of the existing arrangement, making, you know, making thousands of euros per week because the, the rules favored them. And when they were regulated, they would stand to lose money. Now in the current situation, there are some people making money out of the existing arrangements through the renting of accounts to other people. 
they were making a passive income and it's not um, benefiting the workers as much as it should be. It's benefiting people who are not working and in some instances are not passing on the tips, not passing on the full pay and more recently not paying on the bonuses which have been offered during the recent uh, delivery flotation which we have been continuing to work with people across the world in different groups. Riders from Ireland have been working with riders in England, in Italy, in France, in Spain, in Australia and Hong Kong, as well as Canada. And we're here to facilitate that process. But we need to absolutely be clear that if you're working along with people, you stay in communication with them, okay? You attend meetings. If you weren't at a meeting, you find out what was said. You don't propose that what you think might have been said, you seek clarification. And when there are language differences, you have to do your best to overcome them. That wasn't necessarily done. And I, just to sort of finish up here, I was reflecting. When we finished our meeting with uh, Leo Varadka, we pointed out the problems, we pointed out what could be done. And basically he said, tell us what you want, tell us what can make the problem. He wasn't pushing either self-employed or employed as the one option. The government really doesn't have a set idea. They want to know what people want. So if it's a minimum of five euros per order, which is what people want, that's fine, you can say that. If it's six euros per order, you can say that, but you need people need to know what people want. And the price per order going down is what people were complaining about. And we've been working with them for a long time. Um, so uh, in that regard, I suppose, uh, you need to make sure that when people tell you what may or may not have happened, you get your information from a reliable source comes back to our first videos. Um, people love to misrepresent the, the facts and the sequence of events. But in our situation, it's all there in black and white. It can be followed, it can be seen, and it can be you know, recorded. And it has been. I've had to do it over two weeks with a journalist from um, one of the papers. And I mean, it was tiring, but I mean, it's fine. Um, and also if you're working with another organization, and you're on, you know, you have to be aware of the FOI in Ireland. This is when I got badly treated by a university in Dublin around 10 years ago. I had to use the freedom of information system to get proof that I was being um, badly treated. That literally, people were, were, were deliberately trying to undermine due process and fair treatment. Now, that is something I learned when I was studying in Trinity and, you know, about freedom of information. But a lot of people are not aware of that. So I have posed the questions that when people do try to undermine the work of others, they must be aware both of the rules around bullying, around uh, freedom of information, around Coco's law, around other things. It's not a free for all. You can't just say what you want and attack someone. And just because you dislike somebody doesn't mean you have to undermine them. You should keep maybe your your, your politics and your friendships separate, okay? And, 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 and communication is key, okay? For some people, they abide by the idea that the enemy of my friend is my friend, and it blinds them to other um, sort of solutions. And I mean, I feel that's the situation we've been dealing with since last June, is that rather than a valid disagreement, it was more motivated at destroying and undermining the progress that has been done. But, um, in any way, in any case, I suppose just people have to get over and look at the facts and build instead of just destroying, build instead of trying to undermine. When you're working together, you stay in communication with each other, you don't just fall off. Because it isn't about egos, it's not about you, it's not about me, it's not about him, it's not about her, it's about what people are living, okay? And the scale of the data we've been working means that there's thousands of people and you have to go about things in a correct procedure. GDPR compliant, you can't use that data to email because of political or, or, or personal disagreements. Uh, you know, the, the, you, um, you have to sort of, you have to do things properly. So I'll say this, progress is still going to be made, is being made. I'm planning to take a step back from LSU as soon as possible. I have family matters and personal issues which I've neglected over the last year. I, uh, it is not my driving ambition to stay involved in LSU. To be honest, I want to be able to make sure that it continues without me. It, that is what's going to happen with the new committee and the new constitution. Uh, we'll be part of USI, Union of Students in Ireland, and um, it will continue beyond us, beyond this pandemic. 
So for the people who are trying to just maybe undermine, I suppose, just maybe reflect on that and maybe their efforts could be better focused elsewhere. Um, and um, beyond that, um, yeah, I suppose maybe the, uh, the words of Charles Stuart Parnell, I was down on O'Connell Street today, no man has the right to set the boundary of the pace of a nation. No man has the right to say, thus far shall you go and no further. And likewise, with any campaign, with any organization, if people want to get involved for a while and go as far as they want to go, that's fine. But if you say, okay, I want to be part of a campaign, but not the organization, that's fine. You can respect that. But what you don't respect and what isn't valid is people go, okay, I'll come on board and what, what you're proposing we do. I don't want it to be an organization. I want it to be a campaign. And then when people go on to create the organization, try and block and say, no, 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 that's not what I want. Because you confuse your personal opinion with what is the consensus of other people. And that's a fatal mistake. And it does happen in some, in some instances. So that's the situation. There have been, you know, verifiably and knowing, knowingly false statements made about there's no students in Elsu, it's just me, or something like that. That's not true. It's never been true. Anyone who attends the meetings knows it's not true. There's reasons why some people don't want to be in the event identified in camera. You have GDPR rules. Um, I have been visible from the foundation because you have to be accountable about how data is used. And, 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 and uh, I'll be stepping back as soon as possible, but I will have to respond to any um, misrepresentations of the facts and, um, and we'll continue to do so until, until it's not necessary anymore. So um, yeah, I just want to wish everyone a happy Easter. Enjoy this time off and do get a break. Do try and get some time off. Um, and for those who have any questions and queries, I just ask you, look back at this YouTube channel. Go back to the first video on the 29th of March, 2020. Go through it all. It's, it is as it's, it's fully there. Uh, all the different videos is fully transparent the entire way. Okay, some people got on, some people got off, that's fine. But we have an excellent new community, um, we have a new committee and I'll share their email addresses so you can contact them directly. These are people on the committee and we'll have open meetings as usual. And those people who attend are people who there can participate in the decision-making process. But if you don't attend the meetings, you um, are reduced to just having an opinion, which is valid as an opinion, but nothing other than an opinion. So, um, so that's fine. If there's anything else that needs to be addressed, it will be done. And I will do so in writing or in any other way that's appropriate. But I'm a great believer in meetings, okay? As I said, I grew up in a time in Ireland, like a lot of us, um, where we figured out that the enemy of your friend isn't your friend. But in Ireland, we realized, oh, actually, my enemy can be my friend in Ireland. That's what we figured out. A lot of this trauma and identity and othering people because of their religion or their color or whatever, these are created. These are divisions which are created. And unfortunately in Belfast this began, we have some difficulties. We hope we can overcome them. Because as we said, since the time of Parnell, when a man was destroyed because some people took religion as being the most important attribute of that man and saying, oh, also, as Irish Catholics can't talk to uh, a Protestant and he shouldn't be part of what we're doing. And it was only after he basically was destroyed um, and he would have been subject. Coco's law would have defended Charles Stuart Parnell, let's just say that. And it was only after he died early and young that people realized, and it was a traumatic event for people. And if you read Joyce, and if you read, it, it, it haunted Ireland for decades and generations to come. That's why in Ireland there's an ethos, don't criticize people personally unreasonably. Play the ball, not the man, okay? There's ways of getting things done and there's ways of just undermining and, and trying to destroy. And when you are working with others, it's best to figure out and not to presume that your own opinion is sovereign. Um, combine with others to, to find that consensus, which is the axis which then rolls the wheels of any movement. So um, yeah, sorry, this is a very long video, but I'm gonna leave it there. Thank you so much. And I will be in touch. You have my email and the, the I'll be stepping back, but the email of the um, ELSU is info at elsu.ie. 
and the committee members have their own email addresses. They'll be able to uh, send them out themselves very shortly. And uh, again, have a good Easter. Enjoy the good weather. Mind yourselves, mind each other, and be kind. Okay, bye.